Okay, so we just learned about torque. Uh, these two definitions that are that are boxed in right here, kind of the definitions we're gonna want to learn, or we're gonna want to use. So uh, we're gonna use those, um, and uh, I'm gonna show you uh, another another possible definition for torque that's gonna be really useful, called the Lebrun definition. Okay, but we'll do it in a problem so it can feel a little more organic. So this is the problem we want to do. So to loosen a pipe fitting, a plumber slips a piece of scrap pipe, a cheater, over his wrench handle. He stands on the end of the cheater. So I guess the idea is that you've got a wrench right here. Okay, and he's put a pipe around the wrench, basically to make the wrench longer, right? So you get more leverage. Uh, he applies his 900 Newton weight at a point 0 0.8 meters from the center of the fitting. So that's this right here. The wrench handle and cheater make an angle of 19 degrees with the horizontal. Find the magnitude and direction of the torque he applies about the center of the fitting. So we basically just need to find the torque produced by this force um, at a distance of 0.8 meters from the fitting down here at an angle of 19 degrees. Okay. So, yeah, let's go about doing it. So let's put our definitions of torque over here. So one was that torque is basically equal to RF times the sine of theta. In order to use this particular one, uh, we gotta be careful about our angle. We can't just blindly throw this angle in here. We need to make sure we know what the proper angle to use is. So what we'll do is we'll come in here and starting from the axis, we're gonna draw our, our, our position vector, R from there out to there. So that's gonna represent our position vector R or radius vector, whatever you wanna call it. I think position vector is probably the most appropriate. Now the angle that we want, there's actually two angles we can choose, but the angle that we want is the angle between R and the force F, right? So again, the best way to see that is to copy this vector and then shift it like this because this is truly the angle that we want right here. That angle right there, theta, okay? So let's figure out what it's equal to. Can you see how that's the angle between R and F, which goes down? You can also just think about it as extending this line this way and then just finding that. Okay, so, so now what is that angle? Well. If that's 19 degrees, then how big is this angle right here? Yep, 71. And the angle on the other side over here that we're calling theta then would be 180 minus that, or 109, thank you. So this should be 109 degrees. So there we go. Now that we know what the right angle to use is, and we've got all our variables. We'll just say, okay, torque is equal to RF sine theta. So the torque is gonna be equal to, the R value is 0.8 meters. The F value is 900 Newtons, his weight. And the sine of the angle is just 109. So let's calculate that, but then I also want you to calculate this. Let's see what would have happened if we used the other angle, the, the 71 degrees. What are these equal to? What's the top one equal to? Can you calculate that? It's like 72 times sine 109. That's right, Tom. Uh, sine, that they're equal to each other, right? The sine of 109 degrees is equal to the sine of 71. So you can use either one. So the answer you get here is 680. The units are gonna be Newtons times meters. Like that. Should get the same answer regardless of which one you use. So we can't use that one, we can't use the 19, right? But we can use either 71 or 109.
up to you. I usually will probably use the smaller angle because of this. And that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Before I show you the other way to do this. Yeah, you, you, the acute angle is probably what I'm usually going to use, Summer. That's right. All right, let's talk about the other method. What's called the lever arm method. Now keep in mind, this method will give you the exact same answer. So you can either use it as a way to check your answer or sometimes this method will be vastly superior as we will see in some of the problems we, that we use. Like it'll, it'll cut down on a lot of math. So here's how you do it. To do the lever arm method, what you do is you take your force and you draw a line and we're gonna make it black. So you take your force and you think of your force as basically extending forever in that direction, okay? So you just, you extend the force up and down. The way you normally would do it on a piece of paper is you just put down a straight edge and then just draw a line for your force, right? And then to find the lever arm, the lever arm is gonna be the shortest distance between that line and the axis. And the shortest distance between a line and a point is gonna be a perpendicular. And that's what we call the lever arm. So this little length right here is symbolized by L, and that L is what we call the lever arm. Now the bigger the lever arm is, the more leverage you're gonna get. That's where the name kind of comes from. And again, it's the, it's the shortest, writing this out is gonna be kind of long, but it's the shortest perpendicular distance between it's probably the least number of words that I can use to describe it but I could have said shortest distance between line of force and the axis and then by default that's perpendicular but line of force means take your force and just extend it in a line forever Okay, and then you'll get the lever arm right there. Okay, now what is the lever arm in this case? Well, it's it's the length of this side of this triangle here that's created with R being 0.8, which is the hypotenuse, at an angle of 19 degrees. So in this case, I would say the lever arm is equal to 0 0.8 meters times the cosine of 19 degrees, right? And then the torque is equal to the force multiplied by the lever arm. So it would be equal to 900 newtons multiplied by 0.8 cos 19. And what you'll find is you get exactly the same answer. They're equivalent methods. Again, this one is gonna be more useful in certain situations. Now to see if you kind of understand what we've just discussed here, I'm going to use another example um, that's going to be just purely kind of like graphical. So what we'll do, oh no, actually I should probably use an actual object. So we start off with, let's say this is the ground, and let's say that I have um, a pivot point right here, and attached to that pivot point I have a lever. So the lever is basically free to rotate, you know, this way and that way about this pivot right here, okay? And then at the end of the lever, what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw a force. And for this, we'll start using vectors so we can actually make this looks good. For this, let's draw a force that goes this way. Maybe like that. So I have a force that's applied, okay? And we need some angles here, don't we? So we'll extend this. Oh, no, no. I have to use a straight line because I'm not going to be able to draw straight enough on this. So we'll extend the lever this way. And then we'll just come in here and create like a dashed line. Okay. Um, and then we'll say that this angle... Um, I don't know if it's better to use an angle, like a number or if it's better to use... 
We're just going to use a symbol. We're going to use a symbol. And if I need to give it a number later, we'll do that. So let's call that angle phi right there. So what I want you to do is to kind of redraw this diagram in your notes or on a piece of paper. And I want you to take a second and I want you to try to draw some extra lines. And I want you to draw what the lever arm of this force would be right here on our picture, okay? Does that make sense? Just as a test to see if you understand. So try, try to draw the lever arm. If you can't do it, it's fine. It's just, this is how you learn. You just got to try it. So force applied to a lever, it can rotate like this. Where's the lever arm up here? And in addition, I guess what we could say is if I call this R from here to here, if you can draw it, then also write a mathematical expression. I'll give you a couple minutes. Is that enough time? Does anyone have an answer? Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and go through this. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do, that is the right answer, yep, Summer. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna extend the line of force as far as you can, like that. And let's just make it a different color. So there's our line of force. And it's lined up right with it. I'll move it off to the side a little bit so we can still see that purple vector there. So that's our line of force. We just keep going up and down. You need to go low enough that you get to the axis because then the next step is to drop a perpendicular line from the axis right here to this vector or to that line. So we need to make that a right angle right there. Do my best. Something like that, maybe? That, no. Maybe there? I don't know. Make it so that you make a right angle right here. And then the length of that line is the lever arm. 
So if you did it right, this should have been your lever arm, something like this little line right here. That's the perpendicular distance, L. And then uh, as many of you figured out, this angle is also phi. We have a right triangle right here, which means that the length L is going to be equal to R times the cosine of phi. Happens to be the same answer we got in the last problem, mostly because... No, 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 no. I'm wrong in this case. It's R sine phi. I was going to say, that doesn't make any sense. It couldn't be the same. Sorry. L is the opposite from phi. So sine phi, maybe it, maybe it helps for me to do this from time to time. Sine phi would be equal to L over R, which then means that L is equal to R sine phi. There we go. That's what it is in this case. Yeah, cosine of 90 minus theta, exactly. And if we were given that angle, we could have used cosine. But yeah. So there we go, that's the lever arm. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, opposite L over hypotenuse R, like that right there, right? Okay, do you feel like you understand what the lever arm is? We'll see if we get to any problems today that use this. I think we will. I think we will. Okay. So, now you may be sitting there thinking, if you learned Torque before, you may be sitting there thinking, well, this is stupid. I don't know why I would ever want to do this, but and that's what I thought too. But, but then I started seeing some problems where I was like, oh, it's way easier. Use the lever arm. Okay, we want to be able to do problems like this, but before we do that, I need to, need to make one other kind of theory thing. So we've learned about conditions of equilibrium. Did we use theta? Yeah. Oh, theta. I just used phi. I don't What did you mean by theta, Kelvin? You mean like this angle down here? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I wrote theta right here, didn't I? That should have been a phi. I see. I'm so sorry. Yeah, my bad. Okay, so, uh, all right, um, all right, so uh, let's talk about uh, the second condition of equilibrium. The first condition of equilibrium is the sum of all forces has to add to zero equilibrium. Yeah, the first condition is the sum of all forces have to add to zero. The second condition is the sum of all torques has to be equal to zero. And for this one, what's really kind of cool about this one that gives you a lot of freedom with how you do these problems is that this is true about any axis you choose. Now, why do I say that? Well, the idea is that we're gonna be looking at problems where systems are balanced, not only their forces are balanced, but their torques are balanced. But the thing is that everything is still going to be in equilibrium, which means it's either going to be re at rest or it's going to be translating at a constant speed. It won't be rotating. None of the things that we look at are going to be rotating. Okay? So there's not going to, there's not going to be an obvious axis that we're going to want to use. In fact, this will 100% be up to us and it will change the level of complexity of the problem depending on what axis we choose. So sometimes we'll pick an axis and it'll make the problem really easy. And sometimes we'll pick an axis and it'll make the problem really hard, but it makes no difference what you choose. So you should always choose the one that makes it the easiest if you can. And of course, if you want to, you could solve a problem twice, once with one axis and then once about another axis and see what you get. So here's the kind of quintessential example of uh, this type of a problem here. Okay, this is the this is the type you're going to see quite a bit in your homework, and uh, yeah, it's just your this is your basic rotational equilibrium problem right here. So let's read it, let's try to do it, and then uh, what we'll probably do is I'll probably do this one completely, 
and then the next one I'll try to give you all some time to actually try to solve yourself. Okay. So let's read what we have. Uh, we've got a 50 pound strut with a length L. So the length of this strut, this is the strut. The length is L. It's attached to a wall with a frictionless pivot. So the pivot is down here. This is our wall over here on the left. A cable is attached 0.4 L from the free end. So 40% of the way this way. And it's attached, oh, such that it makes an angle of 90 degrees. So that's, an, that's a right angle right there. And you can't see it here, but the idea is that this goes up and then this eventually meets up with it right here, right? So the string basically keeps going until it connects to the wall. Uh, okay. And a 100 pound block is attached to the free end. So we've got 100 pounds attached to the end right here. And we wanna find the tension in our cable up here. And we also wanna find the horizontal and vertical components of the force of the pivot on the strut. That's, a, that's quite a mouthful. Um, but uh, we'll talk about what that means. Have you all seen problems like this in your like 2A class or your, your high school physics class? Do you remember problems like this? It's possible whatever physics class you took before this, maybe you never got to these kind of problems. I don't know. I'm just kind of curious what, what your background is. Has anyone at all seen problems like this? Yeah, I'm doing a lot. Okay. You don't think you've seen it? Okay. Yeah, I, again, I don't know. I, I know it kind of depends on how fast your physics 2A class went. You see in a couple wall glossy, you have definitely some problems like this in the lab manual for sure. Okay. If you haven't seen it, that's, that's totally fine. These problems are pretty fun. Oh, you saw it in high school physics, but not in 2A. Yeah. I could see how uh, it might get, it might get skipped over. And I, especially during, if you took 2A during the pandemic, I'm sure you probably didn't get through as much stuff because it's just, it's just the nature of the how this goes. Well, uh, the way we're going to solve these type of problems, this is the thing I love about these problems, is because there there is a, a very specific, like, algorithm for what you do to solve these problems, okay? And the algorithm, we already kind of know it, okay? Step one, draw forces. But the difference now, oh yeah, you had like a different professor. That's interesting. Okay. So step one is draw forces. And in this case, you want to draw them where they actually are. Because where they are is going to affect um, the torques. So let's go in here and let's draw some forces. So we'll use, I guess, green's fine. Yeah, let's use red. Should stand out really well. Now I'm going to draw them on the picture here. Realistically, you should probably make your own picture. We're going to have a tension force going that way. We're going to have the weight of our. Uh, draw it down to like there. The weight of our block right here. Oh, oh, oh. In this case, I'm drawing forces just on this strut now. Okay, I'm not going to worry about any other forces. Not gonna worry about any other forces. Probably just wait to put answers in Ton until uh, until we've kind of got through the problem. It's not very helpful to just put numbers in chat without any kind of reference. So yeah, we got those two forces. You've got I'll, I'm gonna call this one the weight. Uh, since it's an equilibrium, the the tension in this cable here should be the same as the weight. This T will call the, t the tension up here. We'll call T, uh, and then um, we also know that the strut itself is fifty pounds, and we're going to assume that this strut is kind of uniform, which means that when we draw in the weight of that object, the weight of the strut, 
We're going to draw that one right from the middle right here. Almost all the problems you're going to do, you're going to be dealing with uniform objects, which means that their center of gravity is going to be right in the middle. Um, and now one thing I notice here is that if I call this uh, 100 pounds, this weight, then the weight of the strut is half of that. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna write right here that this is this is W divided by two, which is gonna be 50 pounds. That way we have less variables when we're drawing our equations. Um, and this is the weight of the strut. I should be really clear about that. or the beam, or whatever you want to call this little object right here. This is the object that we're drawing all the forces on, is this thing here. Now, in addition to the tension, the weight, and this, the weight of the strut, there are also going to be forces right here at this, uh, at this point. The pivot itself is going to have forces acting on it. And usually the way that we draw those, just to simplify our math, is we say whatever force exists at the pivot right here, it has to have components. And one of the components will point like that. And the other component is going to point straight up. Like that. Now, I don't know how long they are. And I actually probably don't even know what direction they point. I can pretty comfortably say that this lower force right here, I'm going to call this one R sub X. R to stand for kind of reaction force. And I'm going to call the one that points up this way R sub Y. And then those five forces make up all of the forces that are acting on my strut here. Okay, the weight of the strut itself, which would pull down. The cord, which tends to hold it up. The weight of the block sitting at the end, which also pulls downwards. And then these two forces right here at the pivot. And those are my forces. Anyone have any questions? Are you just using the weight of the block to get the 50 albums of the weight of the strut? Yeah, is this confusing? Should I just not do that? Should I just give it its own name? Like, should I just call this like the weight of the strut or something? No, you're good. It's just I'm kind of confused on why you would use the weight of the block for the weight of the strut. Because they're related to each other. But it's 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 obviously confusing. I thought it was confusing. I won't do it. We'll just do. We'll do that. We'll just say that's the way to the strut. It's to avoid these subscripts and stuff. All right. So uh, there we go. Uh, R Y R X T W S W. Those are all our forces. We've drawn all the forces where they're located. Okay. So step two. What we want to do now is we basically want to apply Newton's second law. But in, I'm sorry, we want to use the net force equal to zero condition. But in order to do that, as usual, uh, you need to pick pick axes. Okay, and then we're going to use net force equal to zero and net torque equal to zero. And then we'll solve. Jonathan, no, the, the 50 right here, it's still 50. What do you mean? I, I was clearly very confusing with what I chose to do. You missed it? Okay, well, this is the weight of the strut, basically. 50 pounds, right? And I'm drawing it right here at the center because it's probably a uniform object, which is going to mean that the center of gravity is going to be right in the center. So you can then draw the weight as if it's acting from that point. And in this case, it's just 50 pounds. You're, you're good. You don't need to apologize. If you're getting confused, then it's probably my fault, Jonathan, honestly. It's probably my fault. Because, uh, honestly, the longer that you do this, the worse I get at explaining things. <laughs> Which is awful. It's just the truth, though. It's like, 
All right, so this is what we want to do. So we need to pick axes, right? All right, how do we pick axes? What's a good way to do axes here? Now, when we were doing problems that were like on inclined planes, we do axes that kind of point this way and this way, right? But in this case, we've got one, two, three, four forces that would tend to make it so that it's reasonable to call this the positive x direction and to call that the positive y direction. Because then ry, rx, ws, and the weight at the end will all point along one of those directions, right? And only the tension then will need to be resolved into ax into uh, into components, okay? So we need to do that, which means that we're actually going to need another line on here. Let's use blue because it's kind of light. So I'm going to draw a line right here. I only really need to draw it to here, actually. So I drew that line because it's it's parallel to the x-axis. And I know that this angle right here is 36.87. So what we'll do is, uh, just to keep things simple here, let's call theta equal to 36.87. And then I would say that this angle right here is going to be theta then. Can everyone see that? The x-axis is parallel to the blue line. So these, uh, when you have two parallel lines, you cut by a transversal, this one you all probably remember the alternate interior angles are equal to each other. You might not remember the name, but you remember that this angle and this angle are the same, right? So if that's theta, then that means that this angle right here is 90 minus theta, right? So in our case, that means that that angle is gonna be 53.13 degrees. And we can use that to break up our forces into their their uh, their components. So let's do it. So our tension force is going to have one component that goes out this way, out to about there. That's going to be what I'll call Tx. And then it's going to have another component that's going to point. Oops, I made that one. Whatever, that's fine. Why does it do it like that? It's so weird. This program is strange. I'm sure it's probably my fault. All right, so that's 53.3. And let's make this a different color. Let's make it like green, I guess. Then we can say that there's not a lot of room in here to write. So we'll just, we'll just call this one T sub Y, the Y component of T. And then the one on the bottom, I'm gonna erase this theta. This one we'll call t sub x. And we'll use the room over here to say that t sub x should be equal to t times something, sine or cosine right here. Cosine, yeah, because it's adjacent. And then ty will be t times the sine. All right, so we've picked x, y axes. After picking x, y axes, new components. Done that. And now we use these equations. And then we're done. Um, so we got that. OK. Let's see how far these equations are actually going to get us now. So our equations say, I just want to kind of like segment this off, that we need to write down three equations now. Net force in the x direction equal to zero, that's one equation. Net force in the y direction equal to zero, that's two equations. And then net torque equal to zero, that's going to be our third equation. We'll just do the first two on the left first, because we've already seen how to do that. So x direction, god, this picture looks really bad, doesn't it? It really looks bad. So I'll just try to highlight, there's just so much stuff going on in this picture. So which force is acting in the x direction? Can anyone tell me? There you go. Rx minus Tx equals 0. So it's not, it's not so bad that you can't at least see it. That's good. Rx minus Tx is equal to 0, right? Or if we plug in Tx, that's Rx is equal to T times the cosine of theta, right? What about the y direction? Can anyone write down in chat what the equation for the y direction is going to look like? We got Ry up. We got Ty up. We got Ws and W pointing down. 
There you go. That looks right. So ty, which is positive, plus ry, also going to be positive, because they're up, and then minus the weights. So minus the weight of the strut, and then minus just the weight of the block. And that's equal to 2. And we could also write ws as w over 2 if we want to. OK. And then all we can really do with this one is just say, OK, I'm going to solve this one for our y. And I, the reason why should be pretty clear after we do one more step. So what I did was I moved ws to the right-hand side. It became positive. I moved w to the right-hand side. It also becomes positive. And then I moved the tension. You know what? I can't use theta here, can I? I really can't. Because I already called theta the angle that was given here. So, shame on me for being really confusing. This should be 53.13 degrees. And this should be the same. Okay, so if you wrote down theta, change those to those angles right there. Now, when we look at these equations, we still have three unknowns, right? We've got T, Ry, and Rx. So these two equations alone will not solve anything for us. It's not enough information. We have to use that one. And since we've kind of run out of room here, what I'll do is I'll save, whoops, I'm gonna save some space so we can come back and use those equations. And we'll start working on our torque equation. That should be enough room to like write the answers down below there. We'll start working on our torque equation. Are there any questions before we keep going? OK. So now what we need to do is we need to choose an axis. When we do this piece right here, remember I said that it was about any axis you choose. So we need to choose an axis. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and just state that we're going to use this one right here, this little pivot. And it's not because it's the actual pivot in the problem. That's not why. I'm choosing it because at that particular location, you have two forces, Ry and Rx. And what we're going to see is that by choosing that axis, it's going to eliminate those two variables. Okay. When you use the torque equation, just to indicate that this is my axis right here. When you use your torque equation, okay, um, I think I can get rid of this. That might make things a little cleaner, a little bit at least. So when you use your torque equation, you have to pick a direction to be positive. So I'm going to choose, we'll just say let, uh, uh, let's use clockwise. We're going to let clockwise be positive. So any torque that, that tends to make it rotate clockwise will be positive. So things like this weight would tend to rotate the beam clockwise. Same thing with this one. But the tension is preventing that from happening by exerting a torque in the opposite direction to balance it out. So the tension is going to create negative torque, and these two are going to create positive torque, just based on my assumption here. It doesn't matter what you choose. You can make counterclockwise positive. We're going to make clockwise positive. And now we got to sum the torques. So let's let's start with uh, um, the weight right here. 50 pounds. So the way that torque works, right, is just to remind you, torque is going to be equal to RF times the sine of theta. So we need a distance. Here, let me, I guess I could do this in, in two steps. So the torque due to the weight from the strut plus the torque due to the weight w minus the torque due to the tension should be equal to zero. Before I keep going, does that statement make sense to everyone? Does everyone understand why these are positive, but the torque from the tension is negative? Yeah, some of all torques balance out, right? 
And we can't just do a bunch of addition here because if we did, then there's no way you can do like, you know, one plus two plus three and get zero. So we need to have something balancing it out. In this case, that's the tension force. All right, so the torque due to the weight from the strut. This is going to be equal to the distance from the axis to where that is applied. How long is that? How far is that distance going to be? From here to here. One half L. One half L. That's exactly right. So that's what we'll start with. So we're going to have that distance from there to there is L over 2. We multiply by the force, which in this case is the weight of the strut. And then we multiply by the sine of the angle between the two of them. Or we can use the lever arm. It's up to you. But we're using this definition for this problem. So what angle are we going to want? Do we want the 36.87 or do we want this angle right here? Hudson, it makes absolutely no difference what you make um, positive or negative in terms of this. It just have, You just have to be consistent. So if for you it makes more sense to make the weights be negative, then go for it. You just got to make the other one positive. Okay, That's right, Ton. The angle that we want to use is this angle right here. The angle between the position vector and the force. So that's the angle 53.13. And that is the, that's just that first term. That's the torque. So you've got the distance is half the length multiplied by the weight of the strut, and then multiplied by the sine of that angle. Plus, what length are we going to use for the weight at the end for our torque? The full length, right? L, because that's the full distance. We multiply that times uh, the weight W. And then we again multiply by the exact same sine of the same angle. 53.13 degrees. I really should have made this theta. But, you know, whatever. We'll just go on with it. Maybe helpful to some people to not have a theta and instead have a number. Uh, minus the tension. Okay, now the tension, what's the what's the distance that we're going to use for the tension? 0.6L. That's right. So it's 0 0.6 multiplied by L. And then we multiply by the force, which we're just calling T. And then we multiply by the sine of the angle. Which part? The, the, the point 0.6L? So what we know from the problem is the cable is attached 0.4L from the end. So that's the distance from here to here. And then we're left with, oh, you're, you're absolutely right. I'm so sorry. I'm, being, I'm going too fast. This angle is wrong. We'll come back to that. That angle was wrong right there. Um, so point 0.6L comes from the fact that it's 0.4L to the end. Since the whole thing has a length L, the distance between the axis and here needs to be 0.6L. Can you see that page? If this is 0.4L, then this is 0.6L on the other side. Great. OK, yeah, so I, I was going too fast. So let's talk about the torque from the tension again. So the distance is 0.6L times T. And now we need the angle between. Uh, we basically need the angle between the position vector, which would come out to here, and the tension vector. But in this case, that angle is 90 degrees. 53 plus 36.7 is the whole angle right here, or you can think of this angle right here. So it's 90 degrees. And sine 90 is just 1. Now, there's two other forces that I did not include, right? Um, I'm, just for completion, I'm going to add those two in. I would also have the torque due to Ry, but that would be Ry multiplied by the distance between the axis to that point, which is zero, right? And then the same thing for Rx, it would be Rx times that distance, which is also zero. So basically, I think you should be able to see now why we chose the axis we did. It completely eliminated two of our variables. It completely eliminates these two variables here. And so that's why it's really powerful. So given that that's the case, our equation just becomes this whole thing adds to zero. And I believe we only have one unknown now, which is just the tension, which we can solve for. So I'm going to manipulate things a little bit here. 
I'm going to notice that there's an L in every term. We can get rid of all the L's. And then I'm just going to start plugging in numbers. So I'm going to shift the T to the right-hand side. So this is all going to be equal to 0 0.6 multiplied by T. Chris says, so whenever we have a pivot point, we got to set our X and our Y even though we don't use it. You are going to use it, though. See, we're going to use it for these. We're going to use it for these. Mr. Murdoch, how did you get L over 2? Right here? Yeah. So this is the torque from the weight of the strut. The weight of the strut, which goes from the center, right? The weight of the strut pulls on the center, right? So the distance between the axis or the pivot point and where that weight is applied is half the length of the rod. And that works off the idea that if you have a uniform object, its center of gravity is at its center, which means you can treat all of the weight as if it's acting right at the center like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then uh, how'd you get the uh, R how'd you get the Rx and Ryt equal to zero again? Because those forces are applied right at the pivot, so the lever arm or it the dis nothing. yeah, it's zero. You get it, right? Yeah, yeah. Now you get it. Yeah, because there's there's no, there's no like there's no like this. Yeah. Yeah, no distance exactly. And again, that's that's why this axis is a good axis to choose. Video game the siege. You'll have to tell me more about what that is later on. Okay, so uh, there we go. Uh, so I moved. Okay, let's go back to what we we're doing. Negative point six t sine ninety. So sine ninety is just one, right? So we move point six t to the right. Okay. In the left hand side, we actually have numbers for all of these. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug them in. Um, so w s over two is going to be fifty pounds. divided by two, multiplied by sine of 53.13 is approximately four over five. So I'm gonna replace, I'm gonna replace sine of 53.13 with four over five. You can check that in your calculator if you want. That's the special, yeah, it shows up all over the place, yeah. And then we have plus W, W was 100 pounds. That was the way of the block at the end also times the sine of 53.13, so we'll just put in 4 over 5. Now, technically, 6.6 .6 is 3 over 5, actually. So I'm also going to put that in here, because it'll, it'll make this even easier to solve. I don't want to divide by 0.6, because dividing by 0.6 is hard to do. But multiplying by a fraction... So 0.6 is equal to 3 over 5, right? So that's our equation. And now what we can do... Here, let's... Let's compactify that just a little bit. I admit, I've left myself a little bit too much room. Now we can solve for t, right? Because we can just take the 5 thirds and multiply to both sides. So if we multiply the left hand side by 5 over 3, this side over here by 5 over 3, obviously these two will cancel. And the left hand side, what we're going to get, the 5s multiply through, right? There's a 4 in both terms. So it's basically going to become 4 over 3 multiplied by 50 over 2, which is 25, plus 100. And so that's going to be 4 thirds of 125. Five, six, seven, eight. 125 is really close to 126, which is a multiple of 3, but that doesn't really help us very much. So I'm just going to plug in my calculator at this point. I made a made a mistake. You tell me if I made a mistake. I get 167. So the reason I got five over three was because here, let me let me go back. So this is what our equation looked like a second ago. This is what we had a second ago. Yeah. And what I did was I basically said, well, that's the same thing as three over five T. And then I multiplied by five thirds on both sides to, to, to basically isolate T. Does that make sense, Eddie? Oh yeah, and I got it, yeah. 
Yep, so then I'll, I'll put it back in so that people can see it. And then I factored out four fifths, multiplied by this. I've got four thirds, got this. Now that we have the tension, the rest of the problem is easy. We're, we're basically done. Once we know what that is, we just plug it in here and we get answers. So does anyone have any questions? Let's make a little more room here. And let's solve the rest of the problem. So right here, we have Rx is equal to T cosine 53.13. So plugging in our numbers, we're gonna get that Rx is equal to about 167 pounds. And cosine 53.13 is gonna be three over five. So this gives us the number that I got. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll truncate it so that it's cool. So that times three over five. This ends up being approximately 100. And then over here, we're going to, so that's Rx. Now I want you to think about the following before we do this here. This equation right here, what are the possibilities for Ry? Could it be positive? Is that a possibility? I'll answer that question in a second, Hudson. Just answer this one for me if you guys can. What are the possibilities for Ry before I do the calculation? Is it possible that it's positive based on these, 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 these numbers over here? I'm not asking you to calculate it. I'm just saying I want you to think about mathematically. It is possible that it's positive, right? Is it possible yeah. that it's negative? No, because of what we said. Since it's clockwise, it should be positive. I'm just thinking it should equal out. That's not right. It can be negative, right? As long as this term is bigger than these two terms, it can be negative. I don't think it's going to be negative in this problem, okay? But it is possible that we could get a negative answer, right? If we get a negative answer, then the direction that we picked over here was just wrong. And it's actually pointing down. But that's fine, because it turns out that the math will just work out no matter what, okay? So that's something to keep in mind in your homework. It doesn't matter what direction you pick, the math will make it work out, okay? It could also technically be zero, right? R y could technically be zero if these two are equal to this one. All right, let's see what we get in this particular problem. So, so we get R sub y is equal to the weight of the strut, which is 50 pounds, plus the weight of the block, which was 100, and then minus t, which is 167. and then multiply by sine 53.13, which we said before is four fifths. Four over five, four over five. I think in this case, it's gonna be, it's actually gonna be a positive number. Let's see what we get. It's gonna be close. I got 16.4. Okay, now I'll try to answer your question, Hudson. So our assumption was right. It does point up. And those are our answers. Okay, let's talk about what these forces actually mean. So Hudson's question was, what does Rx actually mean? So Rx is effectively the force that the joint or the pivot places onto the strut in the x direction. And Ry is the force that's placed on the strut in the upward direction. So this pivot point is basically supporting our strut with an upward force and a force to the right. See this tension here is basically causing the strut to be pulled towards the wall, right? But that tension has a component that goes this way. And that component, right? You're absolutely right. Uh, if I wanted to draw these to scale, we would definitely need to scale this one out longer, right? Whoa, that didn't work how I wanted it to. Can I do a control Z? There we go. Yeah, Rx should technically be about 10 times as long or a little less. 
it'd be like eight times as long as our y. Did that, did that answer your question at all? Hudson, I kind of stopped in the middle of my explanation about what these forces are. It's just kind of the, you could think of them as normal forces if you want to. You know, you could think of them as normal forces if you want to. Let me, let me give you, yeah, normal forces makes more sense. Okay, I was going to give you another example of a similar situation. Suppose that I that I tell you I've got a, a pivot point like this right here, and I've got a bar, like a lever, okay? And let's say there's a ceiling right here, okay? And all we do is we say we're going to support this object by placing a cord like this, okay? So I've got my pivot. I've got basically similar to what we have going on here, except it's just the strut. It has a pivot point right here, and I, just, I place a cord right here so I can support it, right? Um, this object is obviously going to have some weight, right? So there's going to be some weight that's going to be pointing downwards on this object here, like that. And there's going to be some tension in this cable right here that's going to point up like this. Can you then see that in order for the system to balance out, you're also going to need to have another force right here? Right? It's being supported on the left end by the by this. It's being supported on the right end by this, and then the weight's going downwards. Does that help you to understand why there's an R Y right here? It's like it's like a it's like a board being held up on both ends by a person, right? It's like it's like you've got a person over here that's holding it on this side. And you got a person over here that's holding it on this side. Each of those people has to exert a force like this way and this way. And then the weight of the object is, you know, this way. Same idea. Yeah, there would be no RX in this case. So can you see why we have an RX in the case of the upper one? It's because the tension's at an angle. So the tension, if it points at an angle, it it basically pulls it pulls the uh, the strut into the pivot. But then the pivot has to has to say, no, you can't do, you can't go that way because I'm a I'm I'm a physical object and you can't push straight through me. That's where the RX comes from. Because the the cord is literally pulling this object into the wall. But the wall stops that from happening. Where the or in this case, the pivot does. Okay, any questions? We gotta take another break. Break time is you're kind of off because we went really long on the first one. But uh, yeah, we'll stop for now and we'll come back.